Well, thank you. That was excellent. You know, um, I think, Tim, not only uh, you had some great questions, you were watching the clock even better than I was. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> very exciting. And Mira, thank you very much for coming. We know you have a very busy schedule. Thanks for making the time and uh, doing the great work. Um, the next panel, continuing on, in uh, social impact investing is also a very exciting topic and sort of brings together a couple of things that have been already um, highlighted in the first two discussions that we heard. Uh, the notion of uh, innovation and how do you identify some of these innovations that actually have a commercial value and can be taken over and, and, and some meaningful entrepreneurial opportunity or companies can be created. And with that intent, you know, I would like to introduce the cross-border Innovation Spurs um, Entrepreneurship Panel, where innovation is identified not just in one geography, and, and it's, it's a notion of uh, not all great ideas can come from only one area, and making it very egalitarian, making it very global. And the folks who are going to talk more about it are far more qualified than me to discuss it. So I'm going to have them on the dais very shortly, uh, led by uh, Dr. Josna Ayer, who is a fellow at uh, Lockheed Martin. And um, we have, along with her, uh, H.K. Mittal from uh, uh, India. And one of the things about this panel is folks have flown all the way from, across from India just to be with us and showcase you know, what they do. And HK is also joining us from India with part of the IUSSTF and DST, et cetera. And Nilesh Shah from the State Department from the US Embassy in Delhi. And uh, we'll also have Pooja Mukul, Dr. Pooja Mukul joining us in a short bit once the panel gets started. Josna, it's all yours. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Mittal and Mr. Nilesh Shah to our discussion. On a global scale, we are seeing uh, attention being pointed or paid to innovation as a key component of addressing many global challenges. These could include water, sustainable energy, food, and healthcare. Um, there have been many trends in global innovation. People, we've seen reverse innovation, looking at making products affordably. We've looked at open innovation, which uh, Ramesh mentioned, that looks to non-traditional sources for innovative ideas. So I'd like to start by asking uh, Nilesh, what he thinks is the spark for cross-border um, innovation initiatives, or what do we mean by them? Um, well, from my perspective, uh, as uh, um, Rakesh was saying, ideas actually come about anywhere, and so what the capital really looks for are opportunities. So if you look at both the US and India, we have very healthy uh, entrepreneurship models both in both places and so the opportunities that are available are really amazing that actually have significant societal impact so from Indian perspective what I have noticed and I have just been there for a year and a half now so uh, but what I have observed over there are people really focused on the social side of uh, innovation because within India, if you look at the mass market opportunities, you have to be very price conscious, and it has to be serving a real purpose. But if you're able to do that, uh, you have an amazing marketplace over there. Over here, we have similar applications available. We have technologies available that are US-based that can actually apply in many parts of, rather than just India. But specifically with India, we are able to do technology transfers as well as the investment capability that goes with that. Uh, as the other panels noted before, to have sustainable application of technology, they must be affordable, but they must also be self-sustaining. It, it cannot be, uh, there must be a powerful economic model is what I'm saying. So there is a sustainability built into this. Thank you. Um, you know, there have been many entrepreneurship efforts that we've all been involved in, uh, the Millennium Alliance, the Endowment Fund, the India Innovation Growth Program. I'd like to ask Mr. Mittal, you know, in these programs, typically how long do projects last and what's the tra trajectory of uh, start to where they end up? Well, just now, before I answer your question, I think I enjoyed the last panel. In fact, I would have loved to be on the last panel because the focus there was women. And uh, 
we have another interesting topic to uh, to talk about uh, now it's it's money money to promote entrepreneurship well let's look at uh, any innovation or any business business itself is risky and if it has innovation as a component it's even more riskier so who will fund this this risk who will who will fund this this kind of a problem which has inherent risk built in i think it is the public resource which can do it public resources need to contribute to to innovations to development of new ideas products and taking it to markets which are untested untried so the first attempt in a cross border thing was uh, by the us and the indian government together setting up this us india endowment uh, board in this what we do is that uh, we promote companies who are uh, located in two countries like one in the company one company in us and one company in india they come together work on innovation together what we have seen is that uh, generally the technology comes from the united states the market is in india about 70 to 80% of the companies work that way this uh, endowment is now about 3 uh, years old it's a small uh, fund where we support about 4 to 6 companies every year and the best part is that uh, this is a grant this is not a loan this is not a equity it's a it's a grant the size is about uh, $400000 in rupee terms it is rupees 2.5 crores and uh, there are very interesting examples which have come up of course uh, pooja is going to showcase one of that which is which is a live example which you will see there's another very interesting example i think uh, this is an open secret that india has uh, uh, in the mobile sector we have done well in the mobile phone sector we have done very well it's one of the india is one of the top 5 countries in terms of mobile penetration uh but in terms of power in terms of electricity there's a challenge especially in the remote areas where you don't even have power to charge your cell phones so there's this uh, young girl just out of college neha juneja who approached us she is actually retrofitted she was in the cook stove business a cook stove business a very energy efficient and less uh, polluting cook stove she is retrofitted that with the technology available in us using the thermocouple to generate electricity out of a cook stove now this provides power to charge the cell phone and a small led light a large social impact with a very small innovation uh before i go further we also need to recognize the role play, uh, played by the institutions like we need quality mentors so tycon actually helps us in evaluation tai tai helps us in evaluating the proposals also finding mentors finding the connect and we are working with number of institutions stanford university ic square institute uh, here in the in the united states let me also admit that cross border entrepreneurship is not easy there is there is a lot of cultural difference both ways you are not if you are not used to the slowness we are also not used to the quickness it it works both ways so uh, let me stop here thank you you know the dst india innovation growth let program me, let sorry let me just okay. add uh, sure. something that hk mentioned and that was the prior panel and actually mira core this the uh, refer to state departments initiatives uh, just speaking for the state department there are a number of programs actually that we are supporting uh, not just in india but in many other places that focuses on on opportunities for women uh, not only just in the entrepreneurship area but women in science in general and with india we have specific programs available that actually take it place every year there are events and this year i know there's going to be a big delegation coming out of india visiting our science academies like nih and national science foundation labs and so forth 
We have several labs like uh, Oak Ridge, for example, that's very, very active in this area to provide mentorship. So once you do have actually women who are very successful in science areas, uh, they need continuity. So if they make personal choices about family or so, there needs to be an easier way to leave, but then an easier way to come back to. And so there are a number of programs available in that. I agree with HK that, that that panel actually touched upon something that's very near and dear to our other policies uh, globally. And Secretary Clinton really, really started several projects in that regard. So anyway, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, I guess the next question I would like to ask is, um, many of these programs, the Indian Innovation Growth Program, of which I am myself aware, have been around for 10 years. And I've seen some of these programs in the sort of, not as each project, but as a program structure change and evolve over time. And um, so have there been some sort of good practices or maybe one should start a certain place and then grow it in a different way for the ecosystem? Uh, so do you have any comments uh, on that? Um, sure. <laughs> um, the way we started the endowment fund, as, as HK referred, it's only a three-year-old uh, fund. But it has already run four calls uh, for grants making. And so it has very quickly adjusted to a lot of the uh, requirements in both places. Uh, since both governments are involved, we have a lot of governmental rules that we have to follow. But at the same time, the processes have to yield real results. So it's a real good blend of how fast you can go at the slowest pace you can keep up with. So uh, it's, a, it's a good blend in that sense. From a lessons learned perspective, I think it's important to have eyes open going anywhere because of the different regulatory requirements and different value systems and different uh, legal uh, requirements as, as well. So because for the people who don't know quite very well, you end up in a taxable situation where it should not have been taxable transaction to begin with. So you have to kind of be very careful. In this regard, uh, we learned how to structure certain things uh, and we, we can certainly provide the resources and, and how we can go about helping other institutions that are willing to come over there and set up shop and do these kinds of activities. Uh, and from India's side, I think you can. <coughs> Well, we have run this program, India Innovation Growth Program, uh, for the last about 10 years. Let me share some of the experiences very briefly. Number one, anything which you do in India is about large numbers. Uh, when you make a call, when you advertise, you get applications not in tens or hundreds, you get applications in thousands. And like, I'll give you an example of the program which we run with Lockheed Martin. The, the applications, are, we get about 2,000 applications, 2,000 innovators come to us every time. The challenge is selecting them, evaluating them, and then hand-holding them. In the last 10 years, uh, what we have seen, we have seen not from our side, but the investors have made an investment close to about $300 million in these, uh, these projects. And these are mostly social projects. And uh, uh, the program has added value in terms of internationalizing some of these products and innovations. One of the biggest challenge in India is that there are innovations who only scale to a certain level. And the entrepreneurs usually stay in that uh, range of about uh, uh, $5 million of turnover, $10 million of turnover, and then they don't, don't grow. They, they stay there. What this program has been able to do is that change their mindset uh, and make them grow to the, to the next stage. Take them beyond that plateau. And uh, uh, other thing which, is, which has also happened is that uh, it is, this program has gone beyond India, US as well. Some of the products developed in, the, in this, this program has gone to the other developing markets. Using India as a base country, using, using India as, as, uh, as a laboratory, for testing out these ideas, because some of the social conditions are still prevalent in India, which you will find in the other developing markets, especially Africa. So this is this is another other dimension which is uh, uh, which has come over. Uh, as far as the long-term sustainability of the program is concerned, yes, 
uh, we are looking at uh, expanding the program, more partners, more uh, institutions. So this is this is the, and in terms of the other lesson learned, earlier we used to get only ideas to get into this program. Now we are getting those companies who are closer to commercialization. So that's that's the other dimension which is uh, which is there of this program. Thank you. Um, you know, for for companies like us, we say diversity is a is an important aspect, and it contributes to the uh, sort of the overall goodness. So, in terms of the diversity of perspective that comes from which we touched upon, the fast versus the slow, and some of those challenges, are there other like kind of cultural or other kinds of challenges that come because of these two different uh, countries that people are collaborating in? Um, let me give you a slightly different answer in that regard. India, the way I look at it, is not one place. I, it has a lot of states, and a lot of the state governments have their own way of setup. So I think when you look at uh, India, you have to be uh, very cognizant of that. So what may be possible in one area may not be possible in some other area. But if you look at the opportunities, there are many opportunities in specific s sectors. Some of the challenges related uh, to any, de depending on the sector that you're in, but one of the main challenges you may have is related to regulatory environment. And again, things may change from state to state. Uh, in terms of opportunities, they may change in state to state. The resources available and the support mechanism that are available, that may be s state to state. I can give you one example because my friend is sitting there uh, related to water purification, for example. If you look at certain parts of the states, you have arsenic-related contamination where there's immense opportunity available for technology that can address that need. In other parts of the country, you have fluoride-related contamination, so it o opens up a huge new opportunity for those kinds of technologies. So I think you have to look at different states and look at the entire gamut of challenges related to that. <clears throat> Just to add to that, uh, see what happens is typically these programs in India are handled by the government departments. Let's face it, government doesn't know how to do business. And then we partner with academic institutions who also don't know how to do business. It is like two blind people trying to guide somebody to, to, uh, to a business. So of late what we have done is we have enhanced our engagement with the corporate sector. Lockheed Martin is one, one example. Where partnership with the corporate sector, now you are dealing with somebody who knows business, who has done it at a, at a large scale. Partnership with Thai is somebody, people who, who know business or mean business. So these partnerships actually are helping and uh, we value these partnerships in terms of the the knowledge which uh, uh, which the partnerships uh, partnerships have brought in, also the the resources which these partnership uh, has brought in. So the, the, this is this is another dimension of uh, uh, these these partnerships. Um, you know, at this point, I would like to invite Dr. Pooja Mukul, who's um, she's a physician and she's going to talk about global going global with her work on prosthetics and rehabilitation. I'm here as an Indo-US Endowment Fund awardee uh, for our project on uh, developing affordable polycentric knee joints for people who've lost their limbs and remobilizing them in India and globally. Now the number of amputees worldwide is rising at an alarming rate with ever increasing war, conflicts, incidents of uh, diabetes on the rise, widespread indiscriminate use of landmines, etc. 80% of this population of amputees lives in the low and middle, in middle income countries, whereas most of the research in prosthetics is directed towards addressing the needs of people in the affluent and industrialized world. So most of these splendid high-tech prosthetic designs currently available are not accessible for 80% of the end users. Astonishingly, even if these splendid designs were made available to people in the developing world by, say, some well-meaning international agency, they would still prove wholly inept. 
largely because of the strikingly different user profiles. Now, an end user in the developed world, an amputee in the developed world would be a person who would be 60 to 65 years old, would have lost the limb as a result of uh, some vascular insufficiency with or without diabetes, would have associated coronary artery problems, some respiratory dysfunction, limited activity, limited lifespan, uh, totally deconditioned. On the other hand, an amputee in the developing world would be a young, healthy, active male who would be 25 to 30 years old with no medical condition and an entire life ahead of him. Now clearly, the same design or the same solution cannot be appropriate for two such contrasting groups. So with the objective of designing high performance uh, prosthetics which are affordable and which meet the occupational, socio-cultural and environmental conditions of amputees in the developing world, the Jaipur Foot Organization collaborated with Stanford University to develop these specific designs. Now the project started as a, a student initiative. We started with the ME382 class at Stanford. And after reviewing all the available designs uh, varying widely in cost, complexity, and function, we zeroed in on the versatile polycentric uh, knee joint uh, concept. And now this polycentric concept is, uh, I wouldn't want to go into the technical details, uh, is uh, a design that closely mimics the human knee. And why we chose to design the knee as the first challenge was because uh, the knee has always been a very weak link in prosthetic componentry in the developing world. And also, uh, it is uh, unarguably the most complex prosthetic component uh, to, to device. So what started as a project with students, uh, later on, the same students when they graduated formed a nonprofit, uh, DREV, Design Revolution. I have my partners uh, here with me. And uh, this, uh, the first prototype was ready in 2008. In 2009, this prototype, the, what we call the Jaipur Knee, was featured in the Time magazine as uh, one of the best 50 inventions of the world in the year 2009. From 2008, that is when the prototype was ready, to 2013, we had fitted uh, over 5,000 patients in India. We carried out extensive clinical trials of the design, and we fitted about 1,200 patients in 10 other war-ravaged countries. After these trials were conduct conducted and we got feedback uh, from patients which uh, was largely positive uh, and upbeat uh, related to stability, ease of initiation of swing, range of motion, acceptability, compliance, durability, etc. But we did have our fair share of failure and patients had their areas of concern. Now based on this feedback, uh, DREV uh, literally transformed the design and now what we have uh, is called the Remotion Knee. Now, uh, we had the remotion prototype, but we didn't have the resources to go any further. This is when we were fortunate enough to get the Indo-US Endowment Grant. Currently, with the Indo-US Endowment Grant, uh, we are uh, doing the final market testing of the remotion knee in India. And uh, we are able to, we are uh, also working on the design and cost uh, optimization, the uh, tooling for mass manufacturability, contract manufacturing, uh, testing for certification, etc. So we were able to do that and we were able to take the step towards uh, being market ready because of the Indo-US grant that we got. Uh, we believe that uh, as part of this project, uh, the knee is ready to transition from market testing to distribution and uh, it will be market ready for India and uh, Southeast Asia by May 2015. Now, although the knee uh, was designed to restore mobility to patients, but uh, it has far-reaching societal impact because that is part of the uh, uh, requirement of the Indo-US uh, Endowment Fund grant. So, you see, when you're restoring mobility to a person, you are uh, enabling him to access an inaccessible environment, especially in the developing world. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's full of architectural barriers. So by enabling him to move, you are uh, encouraging social integration. By giving him the mobility, you are also giving him access to education, health, and employment. So you are uh, sort of giving him individual autonomy. So the limb is not just working as uh, 
a device to mobilize, but it is also a poverty alleviator uh, in a sense. And if we look at the social return of investment, and if we think that a person who's uh, lost his limb and is being fitted with a remotion knee, uh, on very conservative estimates, if we say that even makes something like $500 in a year, so the social return of investment per knee is $500 uh, for each patient that's fitted. Uh, if we look at the market size, uh, I really would not like to call my patients, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to call them, use the word market, but I guess that's the language most people here understand. So uh, based on WHO estimates, there are about 10 million people in the developing world that need a knee. And, and the replacement rates of uh, artificial limbs are once in every three years. So we need 3.3 million knees every year. Uh, if you look at the served market currently, again, according to WHO estimates, uh, is only 5%. So only 165,000 knees are, being, uh, are available as of now. So there's a huge need. The cost of the knee, again, because affordability is, uh, has to be woven into any design that uh, we are developing for the low and middle income countries. So this joint costs, uh, it's been priced at $80 as opposed to Anything, the cheapest, if you look at, would cost $1,000. The Time magazine says uh, comparable option is $8,000. Uh, US dollars. So it's, uh, it's really a minuscule of the cost. Uh, I close by saying that uh, many people would consider walking on air or water, you know, a miracle. Take my word, a person who's lost a limb in the developing world, it's a miracle that he can walk on Earth. I leave you to see a small clip of these patients who've been fitted with a remotion knee and how they've gone back to living a full life. Thank you. After that inspiring video, I would like to end our uh, session and ask for a few final comments. Mr. Mittal or Nilesh? Uh, sure. We are, uh, on behalf of the endowment board, clearly, I mean, you saw the impact uh, these kinds of investments can make. Uh, we have a number of such programs like that, and for those who are interested in the audience to actually be involved in any of these types of investments, there are huge opportunities available, uh, especially in the M Health area, for example. Uh, the mobile-based uh, diagnostics area is huge, not just in India, but many parts of the world that is uh, really uh, mushrooming. Uh, financial services is another area. Uh, another area is off-grid power generation. So you, there are multiple areas that you can actually invest in, huge market potential, and if you are able to price it appropriately for the market, it is self-sustaining and it's profitable and economically viable. So those would be my things. Well, Nilesh has almost covered uh, everything. The only point I would like to restress is that uh, uh, in the developing world, make it affordable, make it cost-effective. And that's, that's the message I would like to leave you with. And uh, the investments would bring in returns. Each of these uh, projects which we are investing in has, has, uh, has a double bottom line. We not only look at the, the returns in, in, the, in, the, in the financial sense, but also in the, in the social sense. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.